Hi, this is John Chris Falusi. I'm here with Tom Minton. Um, Tom and I were the first guys uh, that Ralph hired to uh, produce the Mighty Mouse show. And our first job was to uh, come up with <laughs> something like 26 stories in a weekend. Yeah. Or in a week. April. Uh, April of, those, of 87, yeah. So over the weekend, we had to come up with all these story premises. And a week later, Judy Price, the CBS Network executive, came in. And we had, and we had, we had pitch to pitch them. them all live. Verbally, yeah. And she bought them, amazingly. And she thought we had been working all summer on the show. Yeah. And we had actually just started that weekend. So it was crazy. These are all, uh, this is the main title, so it's all cut from the first, like, three or four episodes together. Yeah. I always loved this title music. There were three different songs yeah. that the uh, composer came up with, and all three were great. And I don't, I don't remember, do you remember if we used them all, or did we just use the one? There was a longer version of this one, which was about like seven seconds over a minute, and they re-recorded it to fit. This is one of I the ones. I have the tape of all the original. That's good. Songs. That's I, the retake. I should have brought it. Yeah, that, you can get to them. That's um. There were score productions in New York. Yeah, Ralph had convinced CBS that uh, we had been working on this show <laughs> a long time because they had just turned down a whole bunch of shows that we did develop. That were all original. Okay, here's a, this is uh, the night of the Bat Bat. Yeah, here we go. That's yep. my lettering I had to do in one night for oh. all of these damn things. <laughs> really? Yeah, because Ralph had fight everybody else, and I had to. I was left in Libby Simon and didn't have, didn't have sub mains. I had to do them all. Here we go. This Wendell. opening, these opening backgrounds here Wendell, are the first wonky backgrounds. Uh, you know, see how they're all twisted and, and watch, uh, watch tilted this. and stuff like this? This became a style Michael afterwards. Jackson and Prince over there. That was Michael Jackson and Prince in the left-hand part of the pen. There's Kirk Douglas was in there. This is uh, some Jim Smith storyboarding here. Daffy. Daffy all those wacky in. backgrounds. Daffy Duck. In, in the 80s, you couldn't do any of this stuff. No. This was the first show to do it. In, in the following year, everybody imitated it, including Tom Ruger's... Uh, uh, pup named Scooby-Doo. Pup named Scooby-Doo. Uh, Beetlejuice came out with Nelvana, and everybody was doing this oh, wonky this is, stuff. This is how John was able to get some credit on a picture, so you know it was a John picture. And it's <laughs> something they couldn't cut it out. There was no way to cut this out because it was. Um, well, Bruce gonna, Tim drew this scene, and he, did. he he just did it on his own. He just had Mighty Mouse draw a caricature of me on the on, on the, the window. glass. Here yeah. he goes. It's a drawing of John. Who still looks like that? This is from 1987. Sweeping the town, but I'm late for work. Can you handle it? Um, one of the things we did when we first started writing these stories, is we never really understood uh, Mighty Mouse's personality. We kept writing him out of it. Yeah. And this was a great example of it. Well, yeah. he, he calls on Bat Bat to uh, do everything to yeah. do his job for him. I think we figured out at the very end of the second season that Mighty Mouse, if he had a personality, it was Mario Lanza. It was too early here. We didn't know who the hell he <laughs> These was. These are all Lynn Naylor layouts, so they were. This is a manmobile. That's the manmobile. Yeah. Taste cold justice. No, um, I've always thought superheroes were hilarious because of how preposterous they are. And especially by the 80s, people were starting to take Batman seriously with things like the Dark Knight. Dark Knight. It just had come out, yeah, this year. It's so I wanted to make a cartoon that just completely made fun of the whole concept. Of, of a superhero that doesn't have any superpowers. So we came up with uh, Batman, Bat Bat, who has the powers of a bat, and his sidekick is a, is a tick. And, and that emblem on his chest is actually guano, but nobody knows that. Right, that's a guano, guano. emblem, the guano sig sign. These are Lynn Naylor layouts here. Um, we pitched this story to Ralph and sold it, I guess, to Judy before we had actually written a script. Yeah. So we had the plot down. Then uh, Jim Reardon was assigned the uh, the actual script to write it up, and, and and really all of us worked together on almost all the stories, but uh, certain people would split up to do to actually type to, to write the script. Like Tom wrote some, Jim wrote some, Doug Munch wrote some, and Andrew Stanton. Andrew Stanton wrote some scripts. He, that would be the second the, season, right? No, on the first season he actually was one of the writers on See You in the Funny Papers and Aqua Guppy. He did do some work on it. Some of his first produced work. Well, this story originally started out as just being a parody of yeah. of, uh, of Batman. But Jim Reardon was really good at one coming liners. up one-liners. Yeah. he No matter who the character was, he would give him some snide remark, regardless of what the plot was about. And it actually kind of made me mad at first, because <laughs> I thought they were corny jokes. No, but people liked it. And then I said to 
Jim, hey, on this particular cartoon, let's let's make the plot revolve around the one-liners. So we mix the two concepts for the story. We'll get. I guess we'll get to that when the when the gags come on. What? All the milk, chocolate, and candy bars has been replaced by steel wool. Well, says Charlie Adler to the voice. It doesn't sound like Charlie, but they say it's Charlie. Find out who did. Yes, sir. I'll get on it right away. Goodbye. Quick ward to the bat pit. One of these. Oh, there's a drawing of the crew coming up. We have a drawing of Wendell here. They cut out. Ralph cut it out before this. As a superhero, there we are, all of us, a bunch of us. Ralph should have a dark hair. I don't know why they did that. He understood as an artist himself, he understood um, what you need, to, the atmosphere you need to do it, and so he kept people off our backs. The other thing is he, is he had to make he had to make speeches every day and then eat up half your time giving you a speech, and you still had to make your deadlines. Do you and, remember the time he held a meeting? It lasted about four hours, and the know, meeting was about being on why time. The, yeah, yeah. about being on time and yeah. why we weren't that kind of making thing. all the deadlines. At the end of about four hours, when we were all like laying on the floor dying and stuff like that, mm. I said, Ralph, I think I know why we're having trouble with the deadlines. Why? Because we spend four hours every day having these dumb meetings. <laughs> this was one of the first cartoons that had visu- visual jokes. Yeah. They may have funny lines, but and everything in the 80s, we were literally not allowed to draw visual jokes in the cartoons. And Ralph was the first one to make it. He paved the way for us to do this because he kept the network people off our backs. Once we had pitched the stories, they basically signed off on them. And we added tons of visual gags, not only in the scripts, but uh, in the uh, storyboards themselves. No, we're already six minutes into the cartoon before we introduce the cow. We're this far into it because it needs that much setup. The first male cow. This was the first male cow in animation. After this came out, there were a hundred male cows. There's a series now called cow- The Barnyard. There's male cows everywhere. Cows that stand on, on their yeah. hind legs and their udders hang below them. Yeah. We originally wanted his udder just to hang out. We wanted the, his shorts to be in the shape of the udder, and that but that was too far at the time. Mm. I got to explain this. Ralph uh, let me direct the voices on uh, some of my cartoons, and it was the first time I had ever done it. But we were having trouble casting this character, the cow. We couldn't find anybody that fit it, and I'd already drawn all the poses of the cow for the cartoon. And then Ralph went out, and he recorded Mike Pataki, who later became George Licker, and he recorded it, but Ralph must have read the script for the first time because he didn't direct Mike. Well, so Mike read every line completely backwards and upside down and put the stress on all the wrong parts of the gags. Ralph brought back the soundtrack and played it for us on the movie Ola, and everybody except me was laughing their heads off. Even Jim Reardon, who wrote the lines, was laughing at the fact that the lines weren't read to make his jokes work. So I, had, I went back, and I took all the layouts, and I redrew them all to make the cow react as if he didn't understand the lines he was reading in the script which actually gave me a million ideas that I later used in Ran and Stimpy. Pataki was like Wendell. He brought you something no actor could bring you. It's something unusual. It is very hard to direct Mike Pataki, but he's one of my favorite voice actors that I've ever worked with because he does come up with just crazy inflections and things that you would never in a million years think of. Okay, here's the, here's the scene where the plot turns on the one-liners, which wasn't in the original story. It was, it was because Jim Reardon... We're so good at one-liners, I thought it might be funny to make the, the plot structure reflect it. He calls it a bad joke meter here. Later he calls it a hope meter which obviously one of them wasn't replaced and should have been. Superhero! Hop, hop, hop! You, you friend! I think he means fiend. That's pure Jim Reardon lines there. I have a date with destiny! The International Milk Exposition! Here comes Jim Reardon line. I had a date with destiny once, but... She stood me up. Yeah. Is this the end of Bat-Bat <laughs> and the Bug like And the beginning of the dehydrated duo? That's Wendell talking. Is that a multiple choice question? And Wendell Washer this was really a storyboard artist that had a great voice. Narration. It looks as though we're going A lot of people who did other jobs before Mighty Mouse got their first chance and to doing, do things here. Like right. I got to direct. Jim, uh, Tom got to write. Yeah. And for 10 years, we'd been doing um, other things like boarding and having to take other scripts that were... Less than funny. Yeah, the animation business in the 80s was filled with really talented people. But you would never notice, you'd never know it by watching the cartoons made in the 80s. Until this cartoon. Because this is the first cartoon that actually allowed the talented people to do what they were good at. And a lot of that happened because you put a lot of the jokes in layout and nobody knew you were doing that. Like right here. Like right here. Yeah, it's all the layouts. He's reading the lines wrong, so I drew it to reflect it. Give up, you coward. Stuff like this. This kind of gag would never have, never have got through a network without Ralph. 
everything is yeah, Ralph, Ralph has a force field around him. He does. Like every, all the physical laws that happen in Ralph's world cannot happen outside that force field. No. And every adventure that you go on with him, you just can't believe what's happening. I, d I don't know how he got this. <laughs> Yeah, one, one, one this slide. was so bizarre compared to what we were doing it's true. just a year before, really wrote up. you know, on Saturday morning cartoons. Here's some poses by oh. Ken Boyer, who was a great... Ken, did, yeah, that's who did the pose. Great cartoonist. Really nice key drawings you want to see here after the shadow sequence. Yeah, another interesting thing about the Mighty Mouse show right. is that you can tell the there. artists... Look at when that. they change from pose to pose. Look at these drawings. Great yeah, stuff. this is interesting that the animators just froze the poses. They didn't continue the animation, and it actually worked really well. It was animated in Korea. No, uh, Taiwan. In Taiwan. The Cuckoo's Nest, cut Taiwan. By a, partially a crew that I had trained on the Jetsons a couple of years earlier. We had Vicki Jensen designing the, the color styling of the backgrounds. She, of course, went on to become a director. She's, she directed the Shrek movies. There were a lot of people that worked on this stuff that later became famous in their own right. Like, uh, Bruce Timm did tons of layouts. Mm -hmm. Lynn Naylor. Uh, Jim Smith. Start looking for a new spokeswoman. Dave Marshall. Dave Marshall. I mean, I made, I made a Ren and Snippy cartoon later that was just about our adventures on Mighty uh, Mouse that with was Ralph. Fire Dogs, too, yeah. And Fire that, Dogs, that, too. Nobody knows, but all that's true. Everything in that picture is true. I'm an arch villain. And I got Ralph to do the voice for it, too. And, and, and astoundingly, he did. And then his family watched it with him, and they were appalled. <laughs> but, but, Ralph, you did the track. I know, but I thought they would make me cute. He actually said this. This really, this is the kind of logic. Oh, he is pretty cute, isn't it? Ralph is not the kind of guy that you would describe as cute. He's an unusual guy. He's a lot of other things. But all that stuff really He's happened. He's a superhuman. That's true. <laughs> yes, I was jealous. There's a mistake here. Right there. Yeah. Why is that held so long? That bothered me for 22 years. There's, Just a mistake. There's, you know, Mighty Mouse is full of mistakes. Uh, it was the first time we ever got a chance to do anything fun. That's true. So we were all figuring it out from scratch. That's true. This is one of the few episodes that actually had a story. There might have been four or five that huh? actually had a plot. And they end by laughing because that's, that's funny. Because it's really <laughs> making fun of Filmation because Filmation ended with, ended with apologies all the time. You know? Yeah, there were a lot of shows that would end with laughter for no reason. So we just, for some reason, we thought that was funny because it wasn't funny.